Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm Rostin. This is Imran, our data scientist, and John, our Spark expert. Um, so for the last couple of months, I've been working on using virtual reality to do things with data. So what kind of benefits can we get out of seeing data in VR? Um, what is immersive data visualization? Why should we even do this? Um, even as far as we've come with computer and machine intelligence, there is no magical computer genie where you take your data, put your data in, and the genie tells you, you know, sell more red cars or you need a human. You always need a human to interpret data. What we get out of all of our technology are tools, angles, and perspectives. Um, what I've been working on is a new perspective, a new window into the data. Um, Imran, our data scientist, um, is the person we built the app for. So this tool is ideally going to be a tool that data scientists will use to perceive and analyze data more effectively. So with that, I'm going to give it to Imran, and he's going to explain the data that's going on in the back end here. So uh, for this demo, we are going to show you a Twitter user's graph, uh, <clears throat> which uh, are talking about the same topic. So we collect these users by looking at the retweets. So, if, so the nodes of this graph are Twitter users. And if a user A retweets user B, I will connect a link between them. So that gives you a, what we call a retweet graph. And the topic of uh, discussion we choose starting from a single hashtag. And then we use word to vec model to find the relevant terms. So we collect then 20 terms. And those 20 terms will then uh, uh, define our topic of discussion. So once I have this topic, I can find retweets, uh, which include any of those terms. And that retweet table then gives me an edge list. So on the right side, you see these users. These users define an edge list. And I'm going to create a graph using this edge list. The edges are uh, weighted. And the weight of each edge comes from the number of retweets. So if user A retweets user B nine times, I'm going to assign a weight of nine to that edge. So once I have this weighted edge list, I can then use uh, graph analytics to analyze this user community. So we do, for this demo, we are using two algorithms. We are using community detection algorithm to find the community of tightly connected users in this graph. And uh, then we're using force-directed algorithm for the layout. So force-directed algorithm gives us 3D coordinates for the layout. And that will then project into this VR. So here is uh, the architecture diagram for this thing. I'm not going to go much more detail, but we are using uh, Twitter DecaHose. Uh, the DecaHose data comes to IBM Bluemix. We then download that from uh, Bluemix to our dedicated cluster. Uh, we're using this cluster for other uh, apps also. And once I have the data in our uh, cluster, we can then uh, do some pre-processing, do some filtering. <coughs> and then we also run the WordVec model on like seven days worth of data. And when we uh, want to create the graph, we only pick out one day of data and see what people are talking about in that particular day. So, and if you need more information about this thing, I will be in IBM booth tomorrow, and I can give you more details about how the backend is working. So with that, I'm going to move to the demo, and the Rastan will talk about the demo. Yeah, so we're going to go straight into this uh, live demo. So uh, John here is going to be uh, manning the Oculus Rift, and we're going to show you some of the benefits you can get out of uh, <coughs> VR data visualization. So I'm going to boot this thing up here. So John is wearing an Oculus Rift headset. And attached to the front is a leap motion infrared sensor. And this sensor virtualizes John's hands. Uh, the first thing I'm going to show you is a data set that illustrates the benefits of being in 3D. What's up, John? Yeah. OK. So um, yeah, these are John looking at his hands. And now he's going to show us this data set. So this is 2D right now. Um, and 
we're going to turn it into 3D. As you can see, in 2D, the nodes are sort of grouped together and clustered up in a way that the pink nodes are mixed up with the white nodes, and the purple nodes are mixed up with the white nodes. But when I move to 3D, the nodes more efficiently form proper groupings. So now these groupings are more clean, more clear. Um, the white nodes aren't overlapping the purple nodes anymore. Uh, I'm going to switch now to our Twitter data set. So uh, as Imran mentioned, our Twitter data set is a graph of users, people who are retweeting various political candidates. So the topic of discussion is Bernie. So these are all topics that are related to Bernie in some way. John is going to filter out some of the nodes. We're only interested in people who have more than about 200 followers and more than about 10 connections. So let's see what John can find. He's going to try to figure out which group corresponds to which political candidate. So as John uh, holds the node, he can isolate a user, Casey Clemens. So Casey Clemens is retweeting Marv Vane, Abby Nichol, and guilt politics. So we still don't know who this group is related to. So Hillary for IA retweeting on the left there, Hillary Clinton. So this is probably the cluster of Hillary Clinton supporters. Let's see if uh, John can figure out what the other two clusters represent. Jordan, Ohio is retweeting Stace Johnson, Core Andrew, and something for Sanders, GR for Sanders. So probably this is the Sanders group. Let's see if we can find Sanders himself. It was a progression. There he is. There he is, Bernie Sanders. Um, so that leaves the white group as most likely being Trump supporters. Um, now, there's this unusual node that's between Trump and Bernie, and so that's Fox News retweeting both <laughs> Trump and Bernie Sanders. Um, now, one of the things I noticed about this data set, uh, as expected, I see that, you know, Trump is farther away from Hillary and Bernie than Hillary and Bernie are from each other. But Hillary and Bernie still have quite a bit of distance between them. So I was very surprised to see that Hillary and Bernie didn't share more users who were retweeting both of them. Um, anyway, so that's a practical demonstration of our uh, virtual reality application. And if we have time afterwards, some people can come up and try it. Um, let's go back to our slides. So, as you saw there, there are some benefits you get out of using virtual reality to visualize data. Um, one of the biggest benefits is simply being in 3D. Some data sets, like graph data sets, may be easier to visualize in three dimensions. Um, there's also data like geographic data, or perhaps even the layout of this labyrinthine hotel that are by their own nature 3D, and those will visualize better in virtual reality. Um, mathematically speaking, it's not always possible to avoid crossed lines with graph data in 2D, but in 3D, you can always avoid line crossing. So there are certain innate benefits you can get. Um, depth perception is another big one. If you can imagine trying to interpret this red graph, this is a scatter uh, plot from an O'Reilly book. Um, without depth perception, you have no idea where those dots are. But when you use an Oculus Rift headset or another VR headset, you get that depth perception for free. You have two eyes. There are two screens showing you what you can see. And then on top of that, even just the micro movements of your head as you're using the device gives you information about what's behind what and where things are in relation to each other. One of the biggest things I think that we're going to get out of VR headsets is just this infinite screen real estate. People like high volume stock traders have 70 monitors all around them. It's displaying different kinds of information. 
But one of the things we've been experimenting with is just opening windows into your desktop. You can have this experience of having a million screens with one VR headset. So I think in the future, high volume stock traders are going to do their trading in a coffee shop, you know, just wearing one headset. One surprising thing I've found is that I think that the, the hand gestures are actually better for manipulating 3D objects than using a mouse would be. The hand gestures are by their nature three-dimensional, and it's relatively intuitive to use them to manipulate objects. I don't think that we're going to be using this to manipulate spreadsheets, but I think that once we visualize the data, the hand gestures will be very powerful for really getting a perspective on it. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Imran one more time, and he's going to give us the sort of vision we have of the future of data visualization. All right, so our idea is to provide a complete analytics platform in VR so that the people can do exploratory data analysis. So you have access to your data, and then you can transform it, you can manipulate it, and then you can visualize it in several different ways. And on top of that, it brings in 3D visualization, which you normally cannot do on a monitor. And also, uh, as uh, Rastan mentioned, you have a lot of real estate, so you can basically have as many desktops as you want in the uh, uh, VR. Another advantage that I found is that when you zoom in in a, two re in a simple monitor, you lose that perspective because all other things just go out of your vision because you just have a very small window. That effect doesn't happen in 3D. In a 3D graph, if you zoom in, you have 3D object, you zoom in, you basically have everything in perspective and that gives you a better idea of uh, how the data looks like. And the other thing that we uh, want to have is uh, uh, the ability to have a collaboration. So you can basically share the virtual reality with other collaborators. So everyone can look at exactly the same thing using the Oculus Rift and other virtual reality sharing uh, mechanism. So with that, uh, I think that's all I have. So yeah, I think in conclusion, this technology is in early days. Um, right now, as you can see, in order to set this up, we have to have a giant computer, uh, a really heavy headset, um, but it's moving quickly. I think, I really think that we're heading towards a future where this kind of technology is going to be widely used, especially by 3D modelers and people who work with highly dimensional data that can benefit from having a third dimension. So with that, I'm gonna open this up to questions or um, possibly demonstrations if anybody wants to uh, experiment with the equipment. Any questions? Go ahead. Uh, it wasn't clear how you use Spark. It wasn't clear how the dimen what are the dimensions in those dots. It's a three-dimensional plot. So what are the three dimensions? So this is a graph data. So it's not a Cartesian object. So it's a graph data uh, which basically just consists of a set of nodes and set of edges. So when you visualize the graph data, normally people plot them on a two-dimensional uh, landscape by some, assigning them some artificial coordinates. And there are different algorithms which can find those coordinates for you. So we are using a force-directed algorithm which basically gives you, I, would want, I think I can say the fictitious coordinates, so they're not actual the coordinates of the data itself, because you know, just the nature of the data is like that. It's a so graph you object. you are taking the data and mapping it to a three-dimensional yes, space. Yes, absolutely. And that's what that algorithm does. That's what that so algorithm does. So what are the three, so there are some kind of a, you're probably doing some principal component finding. The no, 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 not in this case. So the principal component you will do if you have very high dimensional data and you want to bring it down to uh, two-dimensional, three-dimensional, right? Since this is a graph data, it doesn't have any inherent coordinates associated with it. So the way you assign coordinates is that you take those two points, two nodes, and if they're connected with each other, you assign a force, like a spring type force to them, and the two nodes are not connected to each other, you assign them a repulsive force according to Coulomb's repulsion. And then you let it evolve over time, and then you find an equilibrium state, and that's what you see there. So I guess the other question is, how did you use Spark? What is your So Spark is uh, being used for all the uh, backend. So we get the DACA host data, we, get, we use Spark to uh, filter out the English tweets, we do the tokenization, we do, uh, so we are also using for some other uh, 
projects also, so we do some sentiment analysis. And once we have this filtered English tweets, then we train word to vec model, which is also uh, in Spark ML. And then we use that word to vec model to define our topic. And when we want to display uh, or create a graph, we just uh, access uh, the HDFS for one day worth of data. And we use Spark also, Spark SQL for that also. And then we filter out the edge list from that data. So that's where the Spark comes in. Once you have that final edge list, then we don't need Spark. Then we can go to Gaffy. This is what we're using for the layout and community detection algorithm. Uh, have you, uh, are you familiar with Meta2? Meta with what? Two? Because they already support user collaboration. And uh, one of the applications that's oh, being looked at mode. How about that? is modeling the human brain, and in particular okay, looking for brain tumors. And it can be done collaboratively, say, between a radiologist and a surgeon. Uh, so, and again, with the back end processing, it would be very intense. I think Spark would be a very good uh, environment for doing that back end processing. All right, here we go. But again, I think. Um, <laughs> There are, there are headsets out there, or soon to be out there, that do already support user interaction. Yeah, I'm not familiar with, uh, with that. Meta2 is uh, Meta actually no. 20 miles from here. OK. Uh, yeah, I uh, have a question about what graph database, how, how do you store your graph? Uh, are you using GraphX? Oh, so we are not using GraphX this day for this thing. So we basically create a graph for one day worth of data. The graph is very small. So using GraphX you know, doesn't make much sense. So we just use Gaffy for this thing. Right. So Gaffy is used for, to create the graph, find the community, and then finding and for the, visualization as well. Uh, yeah. for, for visualization, we basically hack the force atlas algorithm okay. to make it 3D. Right? So that's what it is. So it's basically graph, Gaffy's algorithm, but we added one more component to it. Does anybody want to give it a shot? No, actually, it's not a question. Uh, just plus one on the head. Really awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Thanks, okay. guys. <laughs>